Hello everybody, Adrian Plass here. Yes, and Bridget, hello. Here we are again, and it's number 71. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And I again, can't think no of significance no, that I, I think all. of, no. Not at all, not at all. None Except of that I was given a wonderful guitar on my 71st first birthday. So there we are, there is something significant. Right, <laughs> on we go. Yes. Well, where shall we start? I mean, we have had some really nice emails, just... Of people We've been very lo- lucky, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. La- yeah. Last week we were talking, weren't we, about the need to balance darkness with light. And it was a particularly glorious day on the day we were doing the recording. And we've had some beautiful days since. And there's been some lovely emails about people just agreeing with that, I suppose. Somebody sent some pictures of birds in their garden. The things that balance the darkness, you know, make it more possible to listen to the news maybe and to mm. I don't, there's also things. been a few people who've written about um the how how little they want to be simply saying things that are supposed to be certain yeah that's but dealing true with the truth and yeah, what actually absolutely. happens and i i really really appreciate that i really yes. really do well one thing happened this week that uh, <laughs> oh well there's always a dark side isn't there <laughs> bridget called me up the stairs earlier uh, in the week and said you have to come and look and uh, I rushed upstairs well I can't rush but no, I, went, I went upstairs you came up quietly on the stanner and one corner of the bedroom ceiling had completely disappeared mm. and when we looked up inside you could see all the stuff in the loft and mm, mm. Um, and there were bits of heavy stuff had fallen through and <laughs> and then the really good news is that we discovered that the insurance doesn't cover it <laughs> because it's due to wear and tear so that's really we we are sometimes do a sketch which some people will know called yes. pure joy which is about following james which says you should regard all difficulties as yeah. pure joy it and starts that doesn't actually, it with me saying about uh, about the car not working because that's, that's right, yeah. very expensive and then you and then say the ceiling coming through so there we are <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway we'll sort it out yeah, we will we? yeah so i was trying to think what else this week and and the only thing that sprung to my mind in terms of the stuff on the news is probably something i'm not really very interested in which is it's been the uh, was it the heavyweight world title? Wasn't well, it's it? one of the world titles. Oh, sorry. Confusingly, I gather there are two or three. But anyway, well, this the, is the heaviest of the world titles. Well, the thing that fascinated uh, yeah. me was simply the name of one of the boxers, which is mm. so well known. But it was Tyson Fury. Yes, it's a mild little name, isn't it? <laughs> well, I discovered that actually, yeah, it is his real name. He was mm. christened. Tyson after Mike Tyson with a yeah. surname like Fury and I thought this guy this guy really really doesn't stand a chance. I think that's really true. No, he apparently was... so. Well what interestingly I've just been rereading some of my Jennings books you know the, the book books about the the um, prep school where Jennings and Derbyshire are which are some of my favorite books ever and they decide to write about a detective and they call him I think it's uh, uh, have I got it here? S- Flixton Slick, I think, <laughs> which seems a good name to them. And then Derbyshire, interestingly, who is a very educated little boy, uh, goes on to talk about uh, Dickens' novels and how, you know, if you're, if you're called something like Pecksniff or Cherubal and Cruncher, Cherubal and Cruncher, <laughs> you haven't got a hope. But nobody could have known that's what they were going to be. But according to Dickens, they all ended up with names that suited them. So, I mean, what was what was the um, the beadle called? Um, Mr. Bumble. Mr. Bumble. And then there was Uriah uh, Heep. Uriah Heep. So, yeah. so um, it's just as well we're not getting... The, the Red Indians, apparently, sometimes are called... Um, I don't know, they, the first thing the mother sees, like <laughs> stag hunting, so they they get that name. But uh, there's a lot in a name, but I'm glad I wasn't, lot in uh, a name. I wasn't named Slixton. Do you remember when I was working with children at a school which was on quite a pretty <clears throat> tough area, and I had two children called J.R. and Rambo, from the same family, you know, Jr. being part of which? Which one was he? Was he Dynasty or was he anyway? He was one of those I think big American an, yeah, things. Yeah, one of those and, big things. And yeah, then Rambo. Yeah. And again, my feeling was these children are being labelled by their parents in a very 
specific way, obviously with quite an expectation on their little shoulders that they're going to fulfil this, really. The interesting thing is that J.R., the child J.R., wasn't christened John Robert or something. He was christened J.R. He was J.R. And Rambo was christened Rambo. He was. So I don't know what Rambo is doing now. No. I don't no, know whether he's a little... performing heroic exploits in... <laughs> In jungles, but uh, who knows? Because yeah. it's quite a, a a thing, isn't it, to call children something, uh, you know, after somebody who's famous at that time. But do you remember when we were in Bangladesh, we visited a, a little slum school, is what they called them. Mm. It was in just one of the worst slums we ever went to. And was you, bag, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and if you remember, the children didn't go to school every day. They just... Some went in the morning, some went in the afternoon. And we went um, there because we were working for World Vision at for that World Vision. T- time, weren't we? And, and there and were pictures. Education was, was part of what, uh, <laughs> yeah. what they did. So it was good to visit them. Yeah, it was. The and school. there were pictures, weren't there, all round, all round the wall that the children were incredibly proud to point to. That's right, yeah. And um, one of them, this is what I was thinking, was of a gun, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was extra- a machine gun. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And amazingly, that little boy, and he was the sweetest little boy, was called Saddam Hussein. Well, yeah, because Saddam Hussein was a famous n- man. And they didn't know who he was, I but don't they'd think heard so, no, the famous no. name. And, it, it, uh, was a, it was an oddly chilling moment when yeah. we said, oh, that's a, that's a good picture. And he said, my name is Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and we thought, no, it's not. But it, <laughs> but it was for all sorts of... Yeah. We've we've had some interesting stories about names actually. We were in Lee Abbey once down in Devon and um there was a lady there who was a midwife at the period and in the place. She's re- retired, wasn't yeah, she? Where, yeah, where 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 the um the T V series was set. Poplar. Poplar, yeah. And she was she told us a story and after she'd told <laughs> us this story I said to her is this story true? Because I'm going to tell other people. And she said, I swear it's true. <laughs> so we're believing and, it. Uh, well, I don't know. if I, I do. No, I think I do believe yes. it. But she was a great storyteller. Anyway, this is what happened. One of the things that the, that the East End mothers liked to do was to ask the midwife if they could suggest a name uh, for their children. So this lady came along and she'd already had her baby and she said, I... I just come to ask you um, if you could suggest a name for my baby because I can't think of a name for my baby. So this is the, this boy, is the East End it? accent that our friend <laughs> used, by the way. That was a boy. So I, she said, "Yes, of course. I well, I'll do my best." And she said, "Well, I just don't know what, where to start." And she said, "Well, how about if you call your little boy by the same Christian name as your favourite?" film star Mm. so she went away and she came back a bit later and she said that was a really good idea what you had it i'm going to call him orson because my favorite film star is orson wells and she said oh that's brilliant well great well (laughs) done as the lady walked away she said to herself what's her second name and then she suddenly remembered the second name was c-a-r-t-e so this little boy was about to be christened Orson Cart in the East End. <laughs> so she gra- grabbed her back and said, actually, that's possibly not such a good idea. But uh, I thought it was very, very funny uh, to be called Orson mm. Cart. Mm. Is the story true? I really hope so. I hope mm. so. Because one thing that also hit us this week, having my having gone on about Tyson Fury and thinking about all these children... We had an email, didn't we, from somebody who was telling us what her name actually means. And it, and it triggered off a whole line of thinking in us, didn't it? Yeah, it was a very moving email, actually. And I, I don't know if the person who, who sent it is listening. Um, but she says um, her name means, in her own language, means limp. To walk, to walk with, with a, a limp. limp. Yeah. And she said this, my soul and emotions seem to kind of limp sometimes trying to catch and keep a glimpse of more of joy and peace. Sometimes, she said, I wrestle with discouragement, deep depression and anger towards God. Why has he not fulfilled my decades of prayer? 
but I don't dare do like Jacob. In the end, we have to accept humbly, don't we? And that is exactly what I cannot, but should do, to gain peace. Mm -hmm. Do you know what struck me most is, is number one, what an encouragement this particular person is in, in, in sending messages to us and um, keeping us going with this for starters. But the other thing was that she's just maybe just not valuing who she is, what she has, because things are not going well, because she's struggling. And I was thinking, Adrian, you know, some of the things you've said, I mean, it's so long ago, we don't need to talk about it, but you did have a breakdown and we meet many people who have had a breakdown. And one mm. of the things as a consequence of that, I know you've described it, haven't you? Well, I think I've, I have said it's that I think ever since then I live with a limp yeah. of, of a kind and that vulnerability is actually has been quite useful in a way. I remember our friend Philip Eilot who we knew years ago mm -hmm. uh, who was in a wheelchair said that people would come to him because he was in a wheelchair because they felt less threatened I suppose mm -hmm. and I think when you've been through a very difficult could be a physical or a, an emotional Mm. Um, mm. Uh, or breakdowns like in other or, ways, or financial in other or ways, marriage yeah. breakdown, whatever. Yes, you, you you're going to limp, mm. and it's a bit too perhaps a bit too easy to say, but I think quite often people will detect in you that there is something broken, mm. and I have to say, however it sounds, that some of the people I have found most useful to me in my life and I've most admired have got something broken in them. Yes. And it doesn't mean that they're smashed. It just means that at some point in your life you probably discover that there is a weakness in you somewhere mm. and that you can break. Mm. You can be mended and sometimes mm. you end up with a limp, metaphorical mm. or physical. Mm. Yeah. That's I right. think that tunes into what quite a lot of musicians, artists, um people who were elevated maybe beyond what they should have been at one point in their lives and then for some reason that breaks down i think very mm. often their message is that they've touched a reality that makes them perhaps more honest with themselves with god with what they think they can do but my fear is that i've also met quite a lot of people who don't feel they've got anything at all to offer simply because they feel they're broken and I mean like you've already said Adrian we've both been really helped and I know other people who have by you know by people who would think they've got nothing to offer mm. but actually because they're hanging on that's what they have to offer yeah. that's the heroism <coughs> the he or the whatever you'd like to call it that they're they're hanging on in there despite not just because so I think yeah I, yeah. I, I mean, the other side of it all, of course, is that some people fail miserably and do fall apart and don't recover mm. or haven't recovered mm. yet. And mm. and it, one doesn't want to be too trite about all this. No. It's not easy. It's blinking well not easy. Mm. Um, and we do need to look after each other, I mm. think. Mm. Well, I think I know. Mm. I know. Well, I was thinking, Adrian, about um, you saying once not that long ago that... Uh, church is more like a field hospital than anything else and I was just remembering your mum who had a major major stroke didn't she yeah. and she was in hospital for a long long time I couldn't she was paralyzed and never recovered from that paralysis but she used to bomb about in her chair didn't she in hospital sort of getting other people to eat up their dinners or put oh, she absolutely loved it yeah. yeah and she found a role yeah within that so yeah. There is a role, isn't there? It's just sometimes one doesn't feel like there it. There can really. be, but yeah. sometimes crawling out of it is very oh, difficult. so hard. Names are, are j so significant. I mean, we, we call ourselves Christians, and because of that, obviously, we end up talking about Jesus sometimes. Um, and I personally don't mind doing that because it's so important to me, and I know you don't mind either. But it is a fact, I think, that the, the very name of Jesus has become almost toxic um, in, in among certain groups of people. 
for various reasons um, what and I mean people outside the church but partly because we've got 2,000 years of people battling to represent their own particular view of who he is and what he mm. does mm. and leaving a sometimes a rather grim residue of something or other that feels very uh, unpalatable and, mm. and, and not something you want to get, get engaged with but it is difficult still to talk about I don't know how people in other faiths feel, but to talk, to use some of these words, these names, mm. Jesus, mm. Um, which for me has a profound meaning, yeah. but for others will, would make them think, oh no, not that again. <laughs> One of those people, as someone uh, I wrote a while ago said, with biscuit colored faces who smile at everything and agree with everything except the most important things in your life, which I think is a bit harsh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Mm. But, but, finding ways to bring God into situations and Jesus into situations in a really ingenious way is something that's always fascinated us, hasn't it? And I was thinking, Adrian, about thinking about names. You know, you mentioned your tattoo that you had done when you were 70, a little yes. cross on your yeah. wrist. Yeah. Well, we knew somebody, didn't we? Uh, we? We still know her, but she was talking about somebody else who's a prison chaplain and trying to find a way to communicate how God felt about these women that she was working with. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty heavily tattooed, a lot of them, yeah. finding their identity and the things that they'd mark their skin with, if you like. And she talked to them. She showed them a little bit in Isaiah. And it is an extraordinary moment i mean isaiah is pretty extraordinary anyway but at one point this is isaiah 49 he says everyone listen even you foreign nations across the sea the lord chose me and gave me a name before i was born and then later on he says that god is saying i have engraved your name on the palm of my hand mm -hmm. And she used this to say, tattooed, you are tattooed mm. into the palm of his hand. Yeah. He can't get rid of it. You are there. Your name is there. And I thought that was one of the most amazing ways. I can just imagine many of these women being able to hold on to that. Yeah. To, to just close their fist and think, in a way that I will never really understand, I am safe because he is holding me. I think in it's, the palm uh, you, of his it's hand. essential you don't try to understand it, really. Absolutely. But well, it I does hope. link in with the poem I read a while ago, which I can't read now, but somebody, a friend of ours, wrote about uh, slapping Jesus, the, the whole of her past coming up inside her like molten rock and just wanting to attack him for whatever reason and then wishing she hadn't and then flopping and feeling awful and then looking at his hands and seeing her name engraved in the marks yes, on, on his hands and then knowing he knows her as well as she knows herself yeah which in the end is what we really mm. want mm. is to know that even though we are who we are we are together mm. that for those of us who, who care and don't find the name of Jesus toxic. No, but I think that's why I read the other little bit from Isaiah, not just the bit that quite a lot of people know about the name being engraved. You know, the Lord gave me a name before I was born. The idea that we were known. I mean, others in the Psalms we're told, aren't we? In, you know, David seemed to understand some remarkable things about yeah. God, doesn't he? And, and for him, there was no doubt that God had knit him together in the mm. womb, that God was involved with him before he was even born. And it's so easy to forget that David did not know Jesus. No, that's right, he just yeah. knew a God he would never be able to put flesh on in any way. Yeah, I, 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 I'm intrigued by the idea that you, we have always had names. Um, and some people will know there's a little bit in Revelation, which is one of those books that's very easy to understand, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, says, I've uh, sussed it. I, it says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, and we won't go into what that means at the moment, I will give <laughs> some of the hidden manner. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it and I love to to think that the lady who who lives with the limp yeah will one day have a 
a name that nobody else knows now mm. but which means you walk strong mm. you are okay mm. and I don't begin to pretend to understand what that means no. um, about the white stone or the rest of it but no. I love the idea that there is a name ready for us and when we see it we will mm. say yes that's mm. who I mm. always wanted to be mm. and dreamed mm. of being mm. yeah mm. which comes right back to Anne Lamott saying God loves you exactly as you are holding you engraved in his hand whatever state you're feeling today and then that idea the the other part of what she said was but far too much to leave you as you are and the idea that there will be something else a new name no yeah, more tears be, be brilliant yeah well it's not happening to some people at the moment so no well um, we've got to get our ceiling repaired so yeah that's yes. right yeah <laughs> we'll anyway, talk to you next whatever week. your name is thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week